First of all, Zion family, again, I pray that you're well. Forgive me for um, uh, the live feed. Uh, something went wrong on my computer, and I had to make sure I went back and actually changed it. Uh, so I had to re-establish uh, the video, uh, the live feed, uh, in regards to it. But again, Happy New Year to you. Um, uh, God's blessings to you. We just thank God for you. Uh, hopefully we won't have any more technical glitches going into 2022 uh, for today. But we thank God for you. Uh, for those that are watching us uh, via various streams, um, um, also I, I will also probably turn on the audio version, uh, which I have not done. I have not called the call post, not the call post number, but our um, our listen in number, uh, conference call number, which I'm going to do here in a second. Uh, for those who do not uh, have internet uh, service, uh, so with that, uh, I want to make sure that we do that, or not on. Facebook Live specifically, um, but I'm going to go ahead and do that here in a second. Again, I pray that you're well. Uh, again, Happy New Year to you, and uh, otherwise we would be in worship on today, uh, but again, because of safety protocols with regards to COVID, um, and of course, uh, what we explained in the course of this week, uh, we weren't going to be in service today, so I'm switching things up a little bit uh, today with regards to uh, how I'm going to conduct this. I'm actually going to do a study, if you will. Uh, on today, which I hope will help to usher in the new year. Uh, please stay tuned, First Mount Zion, uh, for next week, uh, because we will, we anticipate being in, in worship on next week, plus um, uh, we will have Communion Sunday on next week, okay? I have not discussed this with the deacons yet, but because we're missing this first Sunday of the new year, um, it will be right to have Communion together, uh, since we're already going through the process of worshiping. Uh, and so forth. For protocol uh, purposes, I will tell you this. Um, again, if, you, if you're if you not feeling well, if you feel like you possibly have COVID-19 um, symptoms and things of that nature, please get tested. Um, that's the only way that we found out, of course, of a couple of members that we knew that were there last Sunday uh, that had COVID. So what we're doing is we're waiting kind of a 10-day period just to make sure that um, folks are safe and, and to get past kind of that protocol. This is the environment that we're in, unfortunately, but uh, God is able. So God is going to push us through it and going to get us through it. Uh, but at the same time, we just want to make sure that we are, um, that we're safe. Uh, I pray that most communications went out, that we're not having physical worship on today, that it will be next week. I know we've had guests and individuals that have been coming to the campus. Um, and I know that because of where I sit as the pastor. So with regards to that, I want to make sure that, you know, our social media and our various platforms are being used appropriately in order to uh, convey the messages that are needed in order to ensure, um, you know, that there's safety within the church. Um, again, um, a couple of people have already kind of made some comments now, you know, that we just need to make sure that we have things clean, uh, even professionally clean, of course, in the church. Uh, just to ensure when we come back that things are uh, safe for us. And that's something that we will make sure this week uh, that we will begin trying to push and task uh, for our trustees uh, to begin uh, doing that so we can make sure that by the time we get to next uh, Saturday and Sunday that um, cleaning protocols have been done in the sanctuary and then we can come back and, uh, and actually be able to uh, worship uh, of course, in a safe environment. Uh, again, we do not know where these two members contracted COVID. Uh, that's the only thing that we don't know, of course. Uh, but because of them actually having COVID and being around in service on last week, we just wanted to make sure that we were safe uh, and not having physical worship on today. So with that being said, again, I'm taking a li little different look um, on our virtual uh, worship. So we're not really be a traditional sermon on today. Um, I really wanted to say that for the really for the first Sunday that we were meeting in service um, and not really to house it on a virtual setting uh, per se. Uh, but um, I, I will save that for next week. But I want to get into a study on today that deals with justice, vengeance, and mercy. And as we begin this process of 2022, I think there's some, some things that we need to really begin to uh, really kind of have levitated in our spirit. Um, because of my uh, doctoral program, it's still 
uh, going on school has not stopped for me. Uh, matter of fact, I'm working on an assignment that I have to do uh, at the end of this week uh, from last semester, which I got an extension for. And, um, and, and much of that really deals with, not the assignment per se, but um, because of all these moving, moving parts, um, especially with COVID and so forth and uh, the things that we've been challenged with, uh, I just want to make sure that we give ample space for the needed time in worship to have the necessary messages and sermons um, and the expositions that need to be done in order that we can convey not only pertinent and relevant messages, but also to get some clarity, to clear the ground, uh, to have some clarity in regards to direction and guidance of what God would have for us in 2022. And I think this is where uh, this is be very, very important as we move into the year. Many things that, that we hope that we we'll begin to change, um, um, things that we're going to need to advance upon uh, and so forth. But uh, right now we st we're staying the course, and especially with our new leadership for 2022, as we continue to move and be directed by God in what it is that we need to do. So be patient. Um, continue to just have a heart for God and a heart of love, and we'll continue to allow God to permeate and move through us as uh, we continue to exalt and glorify his name in 2022. And so with that said, I'm gonna keep going back to my phone. The reason why is because I need to turn my, um, turn on the conference call line. So um, please dial in or, or tell people to dial in at 978-990-5000. Um, and I'm just going through the process now of, All right, the conference call line is open now, and if you wish to call in, 978-990-5000, 978-990-5000, and the conference call line number um, code is 148-924. Again, 148-924. So I'm going to get into this lesson on today, and it'll, it'll take about an hour or so to go through it. I do have some lasting comments at the very end that I want to give as we had this first Sunday in um, in uh, 2022. But it's called Justice, Vengeance, and Mercy. Uh, and of course, this is coming from our Sunday School book. And I know I've been doing some, I haven't been doing a lot of Sunday School lessons uh, over, the la oh, over the last month or so. Uh, and that's because of just a lot of the school work I've been doing and so forth and um, not really having a lot of time to actually do the recordings. Um, not an excuse. I just need to go through and begin doing that. If you start 2022 and begin pushing that and getting those things recorded so that those lessons are out there on um, Facebook when you need them and you can actually go and um, see them. And also keep in mind, uh, please keep in mind, anything that we record goes on our YouTube page. We do have a YouTube page. So uh, you can direct people um, if they can't go to our Facebook page, if they haven't liked our page. They can see any of our services, any of our studies, any of our sermons, sermons and word. They can go to our YouTube page and all of that is out there. That's the beauty of having a third party vendor that does this as a, uh, does this professionally, that we literally can hand this off to their company and um, to their company. And they take all, care of all of this for us because we pay for it. So. This is uh, the beauty of, of why we have the things that we have, even our social media page on Facebook. So these things don't just come about. Um, again, there's some planning and, and resources that have to be given in order for these things to happen. And I'll be honest with you, First Mount Zion, we're in a good place. We're in a very good place with regards to that, maybe versus some other churches um, that haven't even gotten the technological piece um, tied in and woven in to their uh, churches, regardless of size, and I think this is something that we just need to keep um, keep in mind. We have the option that we can switch to virtual whenever we, whenever we need to, so that we can make sure that everything goes forward. But remember, this is not just switching to virtual; it's the matter of doing virtual uh, even as we do live ministry. So this never goes away; it becomes a recording, if you will, um, that it, that gets cached 
and we can share with anyone. So anytime that you uh, hear someone say, well, you know, I missed the sermon from last week or I missed the study from last week or so forth. I wish I would have been there. Well, you can still be there. Tell, just direct them to our YouTube page. Tell them to look up First Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church. Once they find our symbol, just click it and then go, go to videos. And once they go to videos, all of our videos, any video that we have shot at First Mount Zion or any uh, e event that we tie to our social media page, it is out there on YouTube. So just want to let you all know that. Before I go any further, and as this preacher continues to talk, <laughs> um, I don't want to go any further until we have a word of prayer. Because it's only right to have a word of prayer uh, in this day and in this time. So again, let's have prayer on today as we go into this lesson title, uh, again, of Justice, Vengeance, and Mercy. So let us pray. Most eternal and all wise God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you. For God, you have been a kind God. You've allowed us to see a year, Lord. We ask right now in the name of Jesus that you bless this time and bless this lesson in faith and allow us to have this space in order to know what your word wants uh, to give us and tell us, O oh Lord, not only about ourselves, not only about our living, but the direction and the mode in which we should be going. We thank you, Lord, for our congregation at First Mile Zion. Continue to bless families, O oh Lord, within our context. Thank you, Lord, for so many um, that are tuning in now and those that will continue to tune in. And thank you for what you continue to do, Lord, in our midst. Bless us in every way and give us what we need on the journey of life. We love you and we praise you in all things. Then we pray, Jesus the Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. So with that being said, I also I want to let you all know, uh, please, uh, any moment, I'm going to do this now before I get into the lesson. Um... Uh, if you wish to go through the process of giving, okay, uh, we have various ways of giving in our tithes and offerings, uh, especially electronically. Let me let me go ahead and communicate that to you. So you can give by way of Giveify uh, app that you, it's on your smartphone, or you can place on your smartphone. First Mountain Zion, we have um, have an account there. You just look our church up. You can give whatever amount from Giveify, which you tie to your bank account, it will automatically debit your account and actually send it to us and so and we also get record of it so our trustees uh, actually are able our finance committee is able to actually track it so we're able to know what giving is done during the course of the year and also who's giving it by way of Givelify. also on our website at www.firstmountzion.com where uh on that home page, you can actually go to the upper right hand corner and there should be a donate button that's there. Uh, click that donate button that leads you to our PayPal app and you can give by way of your debit card there. Uh, also, uh, our drop box is at the church. Anytime that you wish to drop by, um, uh, the address of 1515 Reed Mount Road at the church, um, go to the side door on the office wing. There is a mailbox drop. It, it, it actually drops into a secure drop box that is locked. Uh, you can actually put your tithes and offerings there if you're writing a check and so forth. Just put it in an envelope and, and put whose name is on it, where it needs to be credited. Put it there. We will make sure to get it and, um, and, and be, be able to get tithes and offerings from there. Of course, uh, the aspect of when we're in worship during our offertory time, of course, you can give during that time. And then also, please, if you cannot get to the church, if if you are uh, wanting to get to the church and you're like, okay, you can mail, you can also mail uh, to the church at one five one five Remount Road, Charlotte, North Carolina, two eight two zero eight. Mail your contributions to the church, or if you want someone to come to your home in the Charlotte. to your home and actually picking those up for you. Again, we thank you for all your contributions, members, visitors, and friends, uh, all your monetary contributions to help 
us do the ministry of Jesus Christ within the place that we call First Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church. Again, uh, I want to get into this lesson. We've had prayer. It's time for, for some word. Are y'all ready for some word? That's that. That's that's that youthfulness coming out of me. That's that uh, get out of that old school and get get into my my little hip hop mode. But that's just me, y'all, um, and y'all know that by now. So uh, let's get into our lesson on today called Justice, Vengeance, and Mercy. Okay, uh, and our aim for change goes this way. It says, by the end of this lesson, we will explore God's justice in the face of human sinfulness. Okay, this is gonna be good. Reflect on the danger of allowing sin to control us and repent of thoughts uh, and actions that could harm others and ask for God's mercy and forgiveness. And our in focus goes through and reads this way. It says, Reginald remembered the anger that once burned like a hot coal in his heart. He had spent most of his life as a troubled person. And by the age of 37, he had not held a job for longer than a couple of years and was about to be fired from his present job. He was in a terrible state back then. His wife had just left him, taking their only uh, only child, uh, a son he adored. She was no longer willing to bear the brunt of his angry outburst. He had, he had lost all that was dear to him because of his bad temper. Reginald's life probably prayed for him right then and there and told him, God has a better way for you. That message of hope started Reginald on the road to the righteous life that God desires for everyone. After a time of working through his anger and committing his life to Christ, Reginald's family was, re, uh, was reunited. As he thinks about the peaceful life he enjoys today, he wonders how different things would be if his former co-worker had not had the courage to confront his negative behavior. And the question here that's asked is how do you react when someone confronts you about your harmful actions? Let me read the question again. How do you react when someone confronts you about your harmful actions? Now, with that, I know many of you cannot give a testimony unless you wish to put it in your comment box box at this moment in time, but I'll use myself as the guinea pig in regards to this. Um, um, I, I, I have the, um, the, the notion many times, um, sometimes to be stubborn. Now, this is something that um, sometimes you all don't see, but um, I, I have a stubborn attitude. I really do. And it's it, it doesn't come across as being stubborn in a hateful way. It's it's not overly aggressive in a uh, pessimistic, again, negative way, but um, I, I'm so much like my grandmother, okay, my paternal grandmother, who was sweet as she could be, but that woman was stubborn. She really was. And, and what I mean by that is that whatever she had on her mind, whatever she was heart set to do, that's what she was going to do. That's what she was going to do. You couldn't stop her doing it, and she went forward on it. So um, I kind of have um, um, that, 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 that hard-headedness, if you will, uh, a lot of times. And sometimes I have to be uh, sat down in regards to moving so fast and moving so quick because it might not be the best direction that we need to be going into. And so when someone actually comes to me, uh, you know, with regards to, you know, uh, whether they say Sean, Pastor, you know, um, is this the route that we need to go? So I've learned to be more apt in listening, okay? Uh, and that took some time. It took some time for me to be able to sit down and be quiet and, and, and allow uh, someone else to speak and to hear and to hear from them because there may be some sense being made out of a situation but there's a better direction or guidance that could be that we could seek in order to solve an issue, solve a problem, uh, or what have you. 
And I think that the stubbornness that I have always has good intentions, but is that, you know, is that the best way of projecting and proceeding to the next dimensions of whatever it is that God has uh, for me and for maybe the group um, that I'm leading or what have you, even the church to do. And I'm always cognizant of that now uh, because truly it is not only the pastor, it is the pastor and the people uh, together as we continue to move toward uh, our, the promised land, if you will, uh, just like the Israelites. And I'm not just talking about heaven. Uh, I'm talking about next dimensions of life, the successes that God wants us to have in life, those next pinnacles of what God would have for us in 2022. I want to encourage someone right now in the midst of this lesson. Uh, so you might hear a little bit of preaching and teaching today. Um, I want to encourage you that 2022 has a multitude of facets in it okay, that we don't know. However, God has set something on your heart. God has set something on your countenance, on your spirit, and, and, and he wants you to perform and to do I want you to have some faith in what God is doing in you this year, okay? You might not know the totality totality of it, and that's okay. But the reality becomes is that if God has you here and has purposed you to be here in this moment, in this time, in this space, then there is something more that God wants to do in you and through you, okay? So I, I think that we need to make sure we understand that because sometimes we limit ourselves limit ourselves to the extremities and the majesty and the magnificence and magnificent mysteries of God rather than sitting down for a moment he's asking you and preparing you for even now okay so i just want to put that in someone's spirit to give you encouragement going into 2022 okay so that question how do you react when someone confronts you about your harmful actions and i've just learned to listen listen to people okay i've learned go and seek advice okay uh if there is chaos and confusion consult god and even ask God, God, if you're not going to speak to me directly in the midst of prayer, send folks my way that will help to guide, Lord, what it is that you're trying to direct me to do. And I believe that when we begin. Desire God to, to desire God's voice, uh, you'll be one. To hear what God has to say in order to project to the next mode or next medium or the next thing that God has for you because there is more blessing that God has for you in it, okay? In those things that he's leading you toward, okay? So I, I, I want to put that in your spirit. And even when it doesn't seem like it's a blessing, okay, where God is leading you, Continue to trust God that it is a blessing that he has for you in it. And it, it will help you along your journey of life as you continue down this road of life. So, um, again, I've learned to listen. I've learned to say I'm sorry. I've learned to know, okay, I was wrong, you know, in regards to a particular thing or so forth. I've just learned these things over time. And I think that when you become, when you come to grips with that, you're able to deal with your own indiscretions and your own frailties and, and begin to understand that uh, you're not perfect. You, you, you don't get it right all the time. But at the same time, um, truly, there are just various things that happen in life. And, and sometimes we get off the road a little bit and, and God has to put us back on that road. I always go back to a, a great hymn of the church. 
okay, um, uh, that we sing on the side. And that first stanza of it is says, time is filled with swift transition. Naught on earth unmoved can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. And so, um, does have swift vicissitudes and changes. Things can be up one moment, down the next. And it's very easy to get discouraged in those places. And I'm, I'm just here to tell you, um, even in those places, uh, there's some level of, of examination, self-examination that we have to do, uh, even on ourselves, to say, okay, am I part of the problem? Am I part, am I part of the issue? And if you are, okay, so be it. At least you have acknowledged that. And now you're placing that under the auspices of the Holy Spirit so that God can work those things out in your life. That's important. Because when you're able to say, I'm sorry, able to say, you know what, I got that wrong. What that does, that's a the definite, that's a definite and assured sign that you are maturing spiritually. And I want you to understand that. Because what the world wants to do is say, okay. Since you realize that you're guilty, then you should be ashamed of that. But guess what the church specializes in? God specializes in dealing with your shame and dealing with your disappointment to the point where if you acknowledge it, God doesn't keep you hanging on your own cross. God says, I understand. But guess what? That's why I sent Christ to die for you. So that when you do come to the acknowledgement of your own frailties, of your own shame of your own faults that you will begin to turn your way to the cross because you realize that your sin and your shame has been paid for you don't have to be crucified on anyone else's cross jesus christ was jesus christ died so that you could have freedom not only with spiritual salvation that gives us Right now, don't be discouraged or let someone else beat you up or you beat yourself up about where you possibly are uh, having having issues or where uh, your character isn't quite where you would like it to be and so forth and where God is doing work on you. If you come to the acknowledgement of that and that you need the help from God to do it, that is one of the first sure signs of spiritual maturity is that you're able to deal with your own and deal with your indiscretions and say I need help in these areas and knowing that you want to improve in those areas oh man I think I said a lot right there um, in regards to the word on today let us get further into this lesson as God would give it to us every now and then you're gonna see me um, take a drink because I just have I get parched so uh, just to make sure that we're going through this lesson uh, appropriately. So with that said, let us get into this lesson. Our keep in mind scripture is coming. is Genesis 4 verses 1 through 16. And let me read Genesis 4 and 10 from the New Living Translation. This is what it says. But the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Again, Genesis 4 and 10. Okay, before we get over into the context of, of scripture, let's get a little background behind this text. And this is one, one of my favorite texts. I love this text uh, in Genesis 4. But uh, let's talk about, uh, we're going to talk about first fruits and we're going to talk about the first firstborn and then get into some other background. Okay. It says here, this word was used in reference to the choicest examples of the harvest that was dedicated to God. According to Mosaic law, individual Israelites brought the best of first fruits of the land to Yahweh. Exodus 3 and 19 
in Exodus 34 and 26. The book of Proverbs promises prosperity to those who honor God with their first fruits. Proverbs 3 and 9. The term is also used figuratively for a person or group that represents a special preeminent treasure. Israel was described as God's first fruits, Jeremiah 2 and 3. Christ, in his resurrection, was described as the first fruits of those who have died, 1 Corinthians um, 15, verse 20 and 23. The Holy Spirit is referred to as a first fruits in Romans 8 and 23. Believers are a first kind of first fruits, according to James 1 and 18. Firstborn. A couple's firstborn son was required to be dedicated to Yahweh in remembrance of the Passover when God claimed all the firstborns. The firstborn of a new married couple, according to tradition, was believed to represent the prime of human vitality. Genesis 46, oh, excuse me, Genesis 49 3. The birthright of a firstborn son included a double portion of the family and leadership of the family. The firstborn would become head of the household upon his father's death. He could sell his birthright as Esau did, Genesis 25, 29 through 34, or forfeit it due to misconduct as Reuben did, Genesis 35, 22, and Genesis 49, verses 3 and 4. And the question says, how do you give the first and the best to God for offerings, including time, talent, and money? Okay, and let's, let's deal with that question a little bit, because... Um, when we hear tithes and offerings, everyone's like, oh, God, and the church is asking for money again, uh, and so forth. But this is a biblical this is a biblical construct that God has already, already set into place and has allowed, uh, know that in order for the ministry of Christ to go out and do the work uh, that it's supposed to do spiritually, that resources are needed in order to be able to assure that ministry work is done. Okay, so this is why the giving of tithes and offers is so important. Um, you know, we've heard over, uh, you've heard folks over years say, you know, well, tithing is, you know, that's an Old Testament uh, adage and so forth. And I, I can disagree with that because Jesus even speaks of it in Matthew 23 and 23. Okay, and I think that this is something that we have to come to grips with that, that the ministry of Jesus Christ, it requires us to give the best. Okay, to give the best of what he asked for. He asked for the first fruits. Again, he asked for the 10%. That's what he asked for. So this is why it's important that we begin to push from the perspective of giving God the best. Okay? And again, this is again, whether that is and I'm gonna use the church, okay, as an example. So to, to keep the lights on, to keep the gas running, to keep um things going, to buy different things that we need for the church to get new carpet, to get new chairs and, and pews, to clean up, you know, to have the building cleaned, if you will. Uh, those things require resources. And I think that when we understand that, then we have a greater appreciation for what the church is all about. More so the community than the building. Because now what comes is that everyone's little bit becomes much. Okay, we think of Jesus Christ and the two fish and the five loaves of bread that he took a, a, a young boy's basically school lunch in so, in so many words, took his school lunch and literally fed 5,000, not counting the women and the children, and did it two times, two, se two separate occasions. So, so it doesn't take a lot. It just takes obedience because obedience truly is greater than sacrifice. So it takes obedience in order that God can take the little from everyone and that he multiplies it because of the faith we have in that which we give. Remember the widow's might? The widow only had literally pennies, and that's all she had. That was all the money she had. She didn't have abundance, but she gave obediently, obediently and was blessed by it because she believed that even what she gave even though it wasn't much, it wasn't about the value. That was all that she had. 
and she still gave it in order that the ministry could go forward. And Jesus Christ honored that. And I think we need to understand that to understand when we think about first fruits and we think about firstborn, this, these are added. Not to be coveting, not to be hoarders, if you will. That, yeah, I got to gra grab all this and it's all mine and not giving anybody anything. That is not how the kingdom of God works. And to be honest with you, for all that you gather, all that we gather, we didn't gather it on our own. God gave us the health. He gave us the job. He gave us the strength in order to be able to earn the living that we have. So you can't pay God for his goodness, but we can surely obey God for what he's asked for. Not just because he's been good, because he's always good, but just because he's God. And he has loved us enough in order to sustain us to be able to do the things that we do in order to earn. And remember, it's only for a season. So again, for anything that we give, it's given for a season to, to be able to be worked with. And then eventually, at some point, some other seed is going to have to be given in another time and space. So that we can continue to do the work of Christ and the work of ministry to help God's people also point them to the way of salvation um, point them to the way of salvation and sometimes pointing the way of salvation is not hitting them with the Bible upside the head on Sunday sometimes it's just being able to go to our food ministry and give them some buckets of food and they see the operation of a relevant Christ in the midst of the giving that we do and not charging anybody for anything just giving, giving and we should have that heart as well Okay, um, let me go into the background a little bit um, um, here in the text. It says sons were important to the Hebrew people for a variety of reasons. The ability to farm and herd animals was vital to their survival. A task well performed by strong young men. Fathers who had sons gained a measure of respect from the community. The birth of Adam and Eve's sons was the beginning of the fulfillment of God's uh, directive to them that they be fruitful and multiply. That's Genesis 1 and 22. Some biblical scholars believe that the phrase, and she again bare, verse 2, suggests that Cain and Abel were twins. The next is not explicit, however, as it is with the birth of the later twins. Uh, Genesis 25 and 24 and Genesis 38 and uh, 27. The story of these two brothers is deeper uh, than that of sibling rivalry. It reflects the willingness and desire of one faithful steward to give his best to please the Lord. Another steward, his own brother, wanted God's favor, yet did not want to give his best in order to obtain it. The jealousy and anger which Cain held for his brother led him to take Abel's life. Wow. And the question here says, what actions a hard one. That, that is a hard question and a very truthful one. Think about this. To that person that is very very hurtful okay um whether we you know lose jesus for a few seconds or a few minutes and we end up cussing someone out okay Just using words that we know um should not be used uh in order uh, profane language if you will that will hurt and damage and demean someone's spirit okay Think about this. All those actions are very regretful. And the reason why they are is because we never know what stage or what will happen in life to them or even to us. 
So this is why having a loving heart is so important as a Christian. Because what it does is it keeps our mind, it keeps our thoughts, it keeps the things that we say uh, say uh, from being hurtful and and um, hurtful and hateful, but more so being encouraging and loving and enduring and encouraging. Uh, that's why it's important. And I think we need to make sure that we are uh, uh, saying and speaking and having the proper attitude, if you will, um, in doing the things that we do. Because once we begin to shun that away, we are, we are essentially moving ourselves away and really deceiving ourselves, moving ourselves away from an adage that is founded uh, in Christ. Okay, our foundational, the foundational elements of our Christian faith are housed within those elements. And I think that when we begin uh, to move away from that, um, to hurtful language, calling folks this and that, and so forth, whether that's, pub whether that's publicly or privately, okay, it causes a deterioration in our spirit. We begin to deteriorate, okay, um, uh, spiritually because uh, that's, a that's a heart condition. That's a condition of the heart. And when those things are coming out, um, um, I'm still trying to think of a biblical verse. It's not coming to my mind right now. But um, I'll get to that later. But the, the, the adage comes in that when you say or say particular things or or um, or do particular things to people and so forth, is it hurtful or helpful? Okay? And I think that there's a, there, I believe there is such thing as tough love, but I believe it can be done in a way that is truly loving, but also to show the gravity and seriousness of a particular event. Because if you go across that line into the place that you're going, it can really cause you greater um, demise, if you will, later uh, if you partake of it now. Okay, and I think this is where we we have to come to a place of, again, having loving hearts. Uh, this is part of justice, if you will, you know, and not having vengeance, not having anger, you know, which is what we, uh, you know, are talking about. Again, uh, having that mercy, uh, having true justice, and not having vengeance, okay? Uh, having an awe between our brother and our sister, as the King James Version says. And I think this is where in Matthew 18, we, we need to make sure that we are having proper relationship with each other. When we begin to talk negatively, so we what are we saying? What are we projecting? What mode is our countenance and our attitude speaking? If it's always downtrodden, if it's always, um, you know, if it's always, uh, I can't stand this person, I can't stand that person, then don't expect. For you to don't expect for your own personal spiritual growth to happen. And definitely, if we're doing it as a community, all those negative effects, don't expect for our church community to grow. Don't expect for it to have uh, fruition or to, to go into a larger extreme. Don't expect for uh, blossoms, if you will. Uh, remarkable and unseen that we've been wanting to have but you can't receive a gift if you're not ready to receive one I know I said the same thing twice but it makes sense, think about it if you can't appreciate a gift that's being given to you how can you truly receive it and I think this is why it's important for us to really self give ourselves true self examination because it begins a process for us to begin to become better, 
not just for us, not just for our church, but for anyone that steps foot into First Mount Zion, anyone that comes into our presence at work, at Walmart, at, uh, um, at Food Line, or wherever you shop, and wherever, wherever we are. If we're working out at McCoy Y or at some other gym or something of that nature, what is your countenance saying? Because we don't need to live our life full of regrets because of things that we said and did to other people that tore them down. Again, life and death is in the power of the tongue. So we need to be cognizant of that as we live our lives because if we truly want self-improvement, then we need to challenge ourselves in those places where we have issue. A large, part, lot, lot of times people won't challenge themselves because they think everything about them is okay. Everything about them is all right. There's nothing wrong with me. Guess what? There's something wrong with everybody. But I think the person has to do a self-inventory of themselves and begin that process. There may be friends of that person that have told them, in love, look, you can't go about speaking to people this way or doing people like this, okay? Uh, um, uh, uh, offending individuals, saying whatever you wish to say and then walking away and thinking that you didn't hurt them or even doing something to them physically that you walk away and don't think that hurts them. That's not what the church of Jesus Christ is about. And that's what we should not be about. And we need to make sure that we are checking ourselves in that regard so that we are forever becoming improved that we are being improved in our imperfections to become a greater work, a better work, a better workman, if you will, a better workmanship for Jesus Christ. Becoming better because God not only wants better, but God has the tools and equipment to make us better. Hmm. That's the background. <laughs> we ain't even gotten the text yet. So take a little longer with this because this is the only time that we're going to have on today. So I'm going to go through um, the New Living Translation, Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. And then we're going to get into the pockets of this lesson and, um, and see what it has in store for us. So let's, let's go ahead and begin. Genesis 4, 1 through, 1 through 12. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. And this is what it says. It says, now Adam had sexual relations with his wife, Eve, and she became pregnant. When she gave birth to Cain, she said, with the Lord's help, I have produced a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. It was when it, when it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flocks, from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But when, but you must subdue it and be its master. One day Cain suggested to his brother, let's go out into the fields. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother, Abel, and killed him. Afterward, the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother? Where is Abel? I don't know, Cain responded. Am I my brother's guardian or am I my brother's keeper? But the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are cursed and banished from the ground, which has swallowed your brother's blood. No longer will the ground yield good crops for you, no matter how hard you work. From now on, you will be homeless, a homeless wanderer on the earth. Excuse me. This is verse, um, I said 1 through 12, but actually 1 through 16. This is verse 13 I'm about to read. Cain replied to the Lord, 
my punishment is too great for me to bear. You have banished me from the land and from your presence. You have made me a homeless wanderer. Anyone who finds me will kill me. The Lord replied, no, for I will give a sevenfold punishment to anyone who kills you. Then the Lord put a mark to warn anyone who might try to kill him. So Cain left the Lord's presence and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word and may it sanctify us to the deepest roots of our hearts. Think about this, okay? Um, I'm going to read here from the commentator writer just to engage discussion um, from really verses 1 through 7. Now listen to this. Eve readily acknowledges that the birth of her first son is the work of the Lord. She also gives birth to another son, Abel. The brothers assume occupations vital to their survival and well-being. These brothers were comparably employed, and each makes an offering of, of their uh, wares to the Lord. God looks with favor upon Abel's offering, but not Cain's. When do when God does not look upon Cain's offering with favor, Cain becomes very angry. No different than any of us. Cain wants God to approve of him instead of examining himself to find any hidden sin. However, Cain chose to direct his anger toward Abel. Not all gifts are equal before God. He weighs both what we give as well as our attitude, hear that, attitude about our gift. Anger, envy, and self-pity can twist our minds and lay the foundations for trouble. God knew that if Cain did not examine his own shortcomings and try to do right, Cain would fall to sin. Anger's sinful fruit was perched at Cain's door. God makes it clear to Cain that he has to master the sin. When we become angry, we must learn to control and channel it into positive results. What are positive constructive channels for your anger? And so I think this is a, a huge question to ask because that sentence here from the commentator writer says, anger, envy, and self-pity can twist our minds and lay the foundation for trouble. Okay, I, I want to help you with something here as, as th this lesson continues to go deeper. Okay, anger, envy, and self, um, let me read that again. Anger, envy, and self-pity can twist our minds and lead us into trouble. Now, how does that happen? Satan oftentimes uses these elements as, as a bridge or as an entry point to get in into our spirit and make us do something that anger, self-pity, and envy would call for, okay? Or at least the worldly view of it. And what God is saying is that we need, when we face those elements of anger, envy, self-pity, when, when they invade our mind, we need to get those thoughts captive, okay? What that means is, is that we don't fly off the handle when we get angry. What we need to do is we need to pull back, okay? That when we have the envious spirit, we need to catch it, okay? Why am I jealous of this individual? Why do I have jealousy towards this person? We need to catch those thoughts because when we catch them before we react to them, then what we can do is we can give proper response based on those feelings that we have. This is so important. Because I can't tell you how many times that I have gotten angry. And I literally have had to stop. Okay? I've had to stop myself and literally go into a place where it's like, okay, Sean, you know that whatever comes out next is going to be either a, a negative response to the anger you have or it's going to be a rebuttal to the anger and the action that you want to do in your flesh, but it's going to be a spiritual response, a spiritual rebuttal to what Satan wants to do with your anger. This is why Paul said in his writings, Paul said, be angry, but sin not. Okay? 
Because we're going to be angry at times about things. But the question becomes, are we going to do something that is going to be hurtful and hateful to someone and cause further damage to the kingdom of God and to other individuals because we weren't able to hold that thought captive or that anger or that envy or that self-pity captive to our spiritual thoughts and our spiritual being before we release something from our tongue or something from the attitude of our actions that was either um, contrary to what the word of God has stated or is beneficial to the kingdom of God because we held those thoughts captive and we made sure that our flesh didn't get in the way of what that anger, envy, and self-pity would have made us do. But what we did was we subjected it under the auspices of God, under the Holy Spirit, and we let the power of the Holy Spirit deal with it. That's why sometimes it's good just to shut up, okay? That's why it's good to just be quiet. That's why it's good not to do anything at times. When you're angry, when you have an envious spirit, because you are so ready to fire your mouth off to say something that is damaging, demeaning, and even dangerous to them and to you. And that's why I think it's so important that we hold those thoughts captive. And there's a way, that's, this, these are positive ways, constructive channels for our anger. Okay? Again, I always go back to that passage in, in, uh, with Paul. Um, I, can't, I can't think about what, what text is in. I think it's in Galatians, but I got don't quote me on that. But uh, be angry, but sin not. Okay? It, it's, okay, you don't be angry, be angry. But do not have a negative response to the anger that's going to cause even further demise based off you being mad. Okay? It's one thing to be angry, but the question becomes, okay, what is the greater good that's going to come out of this? What, what, for me being angry, why am I angry? Start asking yourself questions. You know, I always go back to the, the general premise. Okay, I'm angry right now. What would Jesus do? Sometimes it's that simple. What would Jesus do? Well, Jesus will pray for him right now. Well, that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to pray. I'm also going to ask God for some help with my anger right now because I want to make sure I constructively handle this and channel it in the right directions so that folks won't get hurt because I'm hurt already based on what someone else has done or said uh, to me. This is why it is so important. This shows spiritual maturity. For you to go through a pause and not do anything based off your emotions is a sign of spiritual maturation. It's a sign of spiritual maturity. You are maturing because you're able to say, wait a minute, I've just been spiritually attacked. Yes, I'm angry, but spiritually, the context of my being is all about Christ. And because it is, my response has to be different because my heart is saturated in the love of Jesus. So that's the way that I'm going to respond. Now, it might even be a very hard answer and a very uh, uh, gravity-laden response. But when you do it in love and without uh, contempt, that is truly a sign of spiritual maturity. A sign that you're growing, that you're growing spiritually in your walk with God. That takes time. It does take time. And God is able to do it through you. But are we willing enough to take a pause, to pause for a second when the anger and the envy comes our way? Those feelings get gulped up in our spirit. Now, now y'all know the example I used and I preached about it, you know, years ago. Regards to, uh, I think it was the Georgia Aquarium when Keenan was a little smaller and, and we up in, in, the, in the place and uh, in the Georgia Aquarium and little kid just stuck right in front of Keenan and starts literally bogarting him out the way and is playing with him and his dad just, is just looking and not saying anything. And I'm looking at him like, did you not just see your child move my child out of the way to get to this uh, exhibit and so forth? And the guy literally looks at me and says, Really? So what are we going to do? Are we going to fight? And I'm saying to myself, really? Is that really the really the answer as, a, as an adult that you're going to give me? Because at some point, 
there were some things in my flesh that went back to some younger days uh, when I probably would have stopped the mud hole in that cat, <laughs> literally. And um, and I had to literally pause for a minute because I'm like, really? I'm like, my spirit is not there, but you're trying to drag me into that place. And I literally had to literally just tell him right is right. I'm just saying right is right. Think about what just happened and what's right in that situation. And it was at that point that um, I, I took Keenan and we just walked off because uh, I didn't want to get my flesh involved in a situation that would then question the character of God uh, inside of me. Okay? So with that being said, uh, again, let's make sure we hold our thoughts and our feelings and our actions. Uh, hold that anger and envy captive so that God can work in it to give that, that whatever response is given, it gives glory to God. And doesn't affirm what Satan is trying to affirm and try to discredit from us. Uh, to discredit the word of God and the character of God inside of us. Okay. The help side of it. Um, let's get into that uh, second piece, if you will. Verses 8 and 9. One day Cain suggested to his brother, let's go out into the fields. And while they were in the fields, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Afterward, the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother? Where is Abel? I don't know, Cain responded. Am I my brother's guardian or keeper? Now watch this. Let me read this from the commentator writer. What we see here is Cain's jealousy leads to him killing his own brother. Okay? Let me, let me repeat this again. Cain's jealousy leads him to killing his own brother. Wow. And now we're talking physical murder in that regard. But my question becomes, how many times has your tongue murdered because of jealousy lashed out at someone and has literally killed their spirit in something that they, that God had intended for them to do and now they're holding back because of a defeatist word that you spoke in their spirit and literally killed their dreams, killed their aspirations, killed it. This is something that, again, we need to be mindful of. And again, that those feelings of anger and jealousy by Cain led him to sin, led him to do what was was against God's will. To it led him to miss the mark. The Greek word is called harmatia. To miss the mark. To sin against God by committing murder against his own brother. Wow. Let me read this. The fact that Cain invites Abel to go out into the field indicates possible premeditation of his deed. However, it is equally possible that Cain led his brother into the field simply to scare or bully him. Either way, Cain's anger ruled the moment. Anger can provoke us to do things we would not do normally. Let me read that again. Anger can provoke us to do things we would not do normally. In this case, in this case, anger took control of Cain, and in the end, his brother was dead. Cain refused to feel any sense of responsibility for what happened. Instead of focusing on doing what was right, as God had told him to do, Cain chose to make his brother the problem. You see that? That's what sin does. Sin will, will literally literally make you see things that aren't there it'll also make you look at things and say say okay i'm not the problem that is i'm not the problem she is i'm not the problem he is 
That's what sin will do. And that's what Cain did. That now Cain has now taken a step back. And rather than doing self-examination on himself, he now is looking at the issue when he actually has the issue and he projects his own issue on something that doesn't have the issue and says that is the problem. Wow. God questioned the whereabouts of Cain's brother. Where is Abel, thy brother? Cain's unrepentant guilt prompted him to answer the Lord's question with a question. Am I my brother's keeper? Wow. See, now, now, now this is huge. Because for, for Cain to ask that question, what he's basically saying is, he's like, um, he can take care of himself. Okay, am I the one that needs to be taking care of him? Am I the one that needs to be worried about him? Am I the one that needs to have concern about him? Do I need to be his keeper? But that's the reality of the Christian church and those who are saved. We are all our brother's keepers and sister's keepers. When they hurt, we hurt. We are a community of faith. When they are joyful, we're, we're celebrating and joyful with them. But to ask that question and to and ask that question to God after God had asked them a question, okay? He asked them, where's your brother? That's all he asked him. He said, where is he? He can't say in so many words. He's trying to remove himself and separate himself from his brother, both physically and and even spiritually. Now what does this say? My question is, are we asking God a similar question? Will God ask us, where is your brother? Where is your brother in Christ? Where is he spiritually? Where is she spiritually? And are we responding to God with a, a, a question that came like the question that Cain asked God, are they my responsibility? Am I the one that's supposed to be keeping them? They grow and take care of themselves. But we never know where people states the state of a person is spiritually. And the community of faith is always concerned about those within the community. Because no one needs to be left alone. And that's the beauty of the church. Let me make sure that people understand this. That's the beauty of the church. Is that when you're a part of the community, you are in, in just that, a community of like-minded people. Because we care about God's humanity and especially those that are tied under the canopy of God. We're concerned. But the question that Cain asked implies disassociation. That's what it implies. It implies separation. It implies he's over there and I'm over here. So why do I need to be worried about him? Kind of a almost a good Samaritan analogy there. And I think I think I might work with that one later. Y'all might hear that one again. Um, because it is an analogy there that again somebody could be poor, beaten, left half dead priest goes by he's not my problem I'm on my way to Jericho Levite comes by he's not my problem I'm on, the, on my way to Jericho but the one that was least expected the Samaritan grabs him takes care of him as if he was his own brother because he was concerned for his welfare. He wasn't concerned about his own welfare. He didn't ask the question, if I don't help this man, something, what will happen to me? He says, if I, if I don't help this man, what will happen to him? That's the unselfish question. That's the unselfish question. The question of, am I my brother's keeper? That's a selfish, selfish um, push away or separation 
It says, ain't got nothing to do with him. But guess what? If if, if Cain was hurting, Cain couldn't do for himself. Would he want someone to help him? Wouldn't he want his brother Abel to come and give him some level of comfort? These are pertinent questions that we have to ask ourselves. Because our actions and our attitudes can easily lead us to sin. Easily lead us to divorce ourselves away from the community of faith. This is why the church engages so much in the community. Because we're worried about the welfare and the state of the community. Those who don't have enough to eat, those who may not have employment and jobs, can we as the church be a conduit and a connection bridge to be able to help in that regard? Just a few things to think about as we project and move forward in 2022. Apparently, God's answer to Cain's question was yes. As he continued to query the guilty firstborn about his younger brother. Hmm. Because we are a brother's keeper. And that's truly a reality. Okay. I'm going to get into this last part, verses 10 through 16. And then I'm going to get into uh, some post things I want to uh, just quickly talk about before we end on today. Um, 10 through 16 reads, But the Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are cursed and banished from the ground, which has swallowed your brother's blood. No longer will the ground yield good crops for you, no matter how hard you work. From now on, you will be a homeless wanderer on the earth. Cain replied to the Lord, My punishment is too great for me to bear. You have banished me from the land and from, my, and from your presence. And you have made me a homeless wanderer. Anyone who finds me will kill me. The Lord replied, no, for I will give a sevenfold punishment to anyone who kills you. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain to warn anyone who might try to kill him. So Cain left the Lord's presence and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. And the, the, the commentator writer writes it this way. The expression used in verse 10 concerning the earth, which have opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood, is consistent with the Old Testament concern that the depths, the depths of the earth, Sheol or hell, whenever you hear Sheol in the Bible, that's it's a reference to hell. Um, have an insatiable appetite for human beings, wanting to devour them at every opportunity. Sheol is not so deep, however, that God did not hear the cry of Abel's blood. Cain is punished with a nomadic lifestyle because the earth, now holding his brother's blood, will no longer yield crops for him. Life as he knew it as a farmer be no more. At this point, Cain finally exhibits sorrow, but it is because of his punishment and not for his mis uh, misdeed, complaining that his punishment was more than he can bear. In his grace, God places a mark, that's verse 15, of protection upon Cain to prevent harm from coming to him. Cain then leaves the presence of the Lord because there was no longer Fellowship between him and Yahweh. His sin was unpardonable because Cain displays no desire to repent or reconcile with the Lord. The broken bond between Cain and God was the result of Cain's lack of faith and not God's lack of mercy. Is Cain's punishment and protection fair? And I would say it is. And the reason being is that God gave him ample opportunity to ask for repentance and forgiveness for what he did to Abel. And even, 
even when even when he cried out saying that his punishment was too hard uh, too hard to God meaning Cain God put a hedge of protection around Cain that no one would harm him but he still asked for forgiveness for what he had done to his brother he didn't he was still self centered he was still uh, still uh, still selfish still tied to his own self aggrandizement wow God showed him mercy in, in an instant and he still wouldn't repent so the aspect of punishment and to me what God did in protection was still fair but there was still a choice that Abel, excuse me, not Abel, but Cain would have, could have made to repent of what he did. But what did he do? He tried to do the self-reflection thing again and say, and look into the Lord and say, Lord, this punishment is too hard for me. Well, do you think that killing your brother was hard for him? Really? Are you killing your brother was hard for me because of what your brother was trying to do to honor me? Again, these are the things we have to think about because we can be so tied up in our own selfishness to the point that we don't see our own faults, see our own imperfections, and sit at the table of, ex of, examining, of examining ourselves and saying, you know what? I messed up. I got it wrong. Lord, forgive me me because I am unfit and then allow God to work with us and work through us to make us better and better suited for the kingdom of God church that's all I have for this lesson and for this time that we have um, I'm about to go on further into my computer because I do want to read some announcements that we have uh, before we begin the process of closing this time out. So you all forgive me because I'm going to another document uh, as I'm continuing to record even now. So with this, um, I ask that we please be mindful. I want to thank uh, our Church Secretary, Sister Ware, for always getting these announcements and things to me so promptly. Um, I'm just having to pull them up um, as we speak right now so I can make sure that these are mentioned over the airways on today. Um, uh, please know that again, noonday and evening Bible study um, will be virtual and conference call this coming up week uh, on January 5th uh, from tw at 12 p.m. and at 7 p.m. And then also um, deacons, um, um, and this is specifically for the deacons, the pastor deacons meeting we will actually have that on this coming Saturday. Uh, this coming Saturday, since we uh, we we were out out of the church, and New Year's, of course, was yesterday. We will actually have our monthly meeting on next week. So please be mindful of that on January the um, um, and forgive me. Today's the second. It'll be the eighth. Should be the eighth. So on on January the eighth, we will have our pastor and deacons meeting um, as we begin the course of this new year of 2022. Um, uh, also, the, the Noonday Bible Study, I know Sister Wilson wanted me to, to put this out there, it will be done by conference call, um, but they may uh, have it uh, be a conference call uh, for the month of January, but we'll get back with uh, the congregation in regard to that, and I need to get back with Sister Wilson on it just to make sure that that's what's going to happen or what she wants to happen for the Noonday Bible study. We are in the 7 p.m. Bible study. We'll meet virtually this week. It will only be online, uh, but we will come back um, on, I guess that will be, let's see, on the 12th. So on the 12th, we will come back um, into uh, the building and the space uh, in the sanctuary in order to do our Bible study. Okay. I pray again that you all are well and having a happy new year. Um, I'm looking for anyone who has um, um, my comments don't come across so quickly sometimes um, so uh, if I miss something that you all needed me to announce uh, I really would um, uh, forgive me it's just sometimes it's just a, there's a delay 
there's a delay in comments and so forth. But again, I thank God for all of you. Uh, I know this is more so of a teaching moment on today uh, rather than a preaching moment. Um, I really wanted to save sermon material for when we actually come together um, uh, on uh, next week. Uh, this week we'll begin the process of trying to figure out the cleaning uh, aspect of the sanctuary and so forth, just for protection for all of us um, in these COVID-19 times that we're in. So please be mindful of that, and we'll have more information, hopefully, in the next calling post in regards to that. Um, before we go, we're going to have a word of prayer. Again, have an awesome day on this January 2nd. Um, go and have fun with your families and things of that nature as you begin the process of venturing into 2022. And we thank God for all of you, uh, friends and family of First Mount Zion, the continued members, uh, as we continue to venture forward into what God would have us to do and to be for the kingdom of God in this season. We thank God for you. Uh, may God bless you and have a smile upon you. Let us have prayer in order to be dismissed on the day. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for this word, uh, Lord, in, in, in teaching of justice, vengeance, and mercy. Thank you, Father, for what it entails. Uh, that, Lord, there's some serious self-examination we have to do in regards to our imperfections. That's how we become better. That's how we become more spiritually fit to do your work and to do it your way. Thank you, Lord, for what we have learned on today. Give us what we need, Lord, on the journey of life and allow us, Lord, just to see your glory as we continue to move forward in your name. We love you and we praise you for all things. Bless us in this new year. Allow us to see, Lord, what you have in store for us and make it manifest before us as we are obedient to your will and way as we continue to move in the direction of your Holy Spirit. We love you, Lord, and praise you in all things. As in your son's name we pray, Jesus the Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. With that being said, again, I'm Pastor Hattie with the First Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we are exalting Christ to restore, renew, and rebuild people to serve the kingdom of God. God's blessing to you. Please feel free to share this lesson to anyone on the social media stream, on Facebook. Uh, please share it on your pages and so forth so that someone can get a word from the Lord on today. It will help them to kickstart, jumpstart this 2022 year for them the right way, which the right way and the only way is through Jesus Christ, our Lord. God's blessings to you. Y'all take care and be blessed on today. We love you, the Lord. And there's nothing you can do about it because truly God is love. God's our speed to you. Take care, First Mount Zion family, and be blessed. Amen.